What does it say specifically about a creative director? There's nothing more positive for a student to see than someone saying, you're doing a great job. And it's not their parent, and it's not their teacher, it's a career leader. You can have this whole idea in your head about how wonderful it would be to be a doctor or a nurse or physical therapist, but when you go and actually do it, it's completely different. Try not to be afraid of them. They're more afraid of you than you are them. We wouldn't have fruits, vegetables without them. So there's the honey, huh? And honey. Everybody likes honey. It's definitely a challenge, just because we have to be here significantly earlier than everyone else is. But it's also fun because it's a commitment. Hello and welcome. I'm Sean Spiller, the host of Classroom Close-Up New Jersey. If you're a young person watching this right now, and you're realizing that tomorrow's a school day, I have some good news. No, it might not be a snow day, but there's never been a better time to think about your future. In fact, the earlier, the better. In this episode, we'll focus on career readiness. Imagine farming year-round, like these students, who are maintaining the hydroponic system here at Wachung Elementary School in Montclair. You'll have a chance to explore careers in medicine, and later, beekeeping. We begin in Gloucester County, where students have discovered a gateway to careers. Google. You got us a job at Google? Not a job job. It's an interview for an internship that could lead to a job. Hollywood films and TV shows often portray internships in comedic ways. But as we all know, real world experience can be very beneficial. What does it say specifically about a creative director? And here at Gateway Regional High School, Melissa Eckstein is taking career readiness to the next level. I mean, I have the coolest job because I get to work with the students, I get to know them one on one, and then I also get to work with the businesses. As the career facilitator, Melissa often brings outside speakers in for career day events, but she also has developed many internships with local businesses. I started to get a lot of, of requests for job shadowing, so we expanded it into the internship program. Our kids go out with the support that we give them, and they become advocates of our program, and they help us grow our program. Melissa Eckstein contacted me one day and said, hey, do you got any room for any inspiring engineers? And I said, well, heck yeah, bring them on over. Started with Career Day, and, and now we do the intern program. SmartFent manufactures products that protect homes and buildings against flooding. We were able to work with a lot of the way they tested, a lot of um, their tools and machinery they had. We got to understand everything they were doing. That really gave me a whole new perspective on things. It made me excited about my career. I'm just really excited for the future now. Neil was just willing to learn. He was a good student. <laughs> There's nothing more positive for a student to see than someone saying, you're doing a great job. And it's not their parent, and it's not their teacher. It's a career leader. According to a recent survey, 95% of employers said candidate experience is a factor in hiring decisions. We started uh, two years ago uh, participating with the uh, Gateway to Careers program. So we have a, uh, an intern come to our practice uh, for three or four months. Keith Wyckoff was also an Army dentist and offers insight to students interested in the military. Seeing what Melissa has done with this Gateway to Careers program has been really exciting to watch her take this program and, and run with it. Uh, to me, really exemplifies what we should be doing in education. We have about 130 career contacts. Of those career contacts, some of them allow us to do field trips, um, take the students over to see the business, and then some of our career contacts become mentors. Some of them will Skype with our students and tell them about their program. So there's various degrees that they're involved. Gateway High School includes the seventh through 12th grades. This allows students access to career counseling earlier than normal. You have them for a longer period of time so you can make better connections all the way through the grade levels. They hear different things. They go through the career clusters throughout the 7 to 12. So by the time they leave here, they've heard all the different areas, hopefully. So that's been a huge benefit for kids. Career Day is so great that I immediately went to Melissa and said, this is great, just as a staff member, not necessarily as a librarian. Seeing that day just re-energized. I was like midway in my 10-year career so far, and I said, okay, I want to be involved in this. And Greta did get involved. She and Melissa recently received an internship grant award from the New Jersey Department of Labor. 
Gateway was the only school in the state to receive this award and were designated exemplary in their career and internship programs. We want to inspire people again. And we kind of got away from that because we got bogged down with testing and, and data. And that's all you know important on some level, but it is about passion and inspiration. Today what you're going to discover is the STEM career that is best fit for you and if they actually A lot of these kids are kids that are going to want to go on and be engineers and such. And so it's good for them to know what calculus is used for and why, why they need to study it and why they need to do well with it. Go to the tab for education and you're going to put in what kind of an education do you want. Today we were able to look at their personal interests and be able to narrow down career fields in the STEM careers that actually fit their likes, their passions, their skills and is it a direction that they want to go. Today you are presenting your elevator speeches to the class and uh, this is entrepreneurship. It's brand new this year at Gateway and basically what the students will be learning is how to set up a business. My biggest goal is to collaborate with other clothing companies and... By the time they leave this class they'll be able to start their own business. They'll have a business plan and uh, hopefully it will teach them about business skills so I think it's very valuable and very pertinent to being ready for a career. What skills do you have that would lead you to in to you know, being an orthodontist. What is the students here are in the Gateway to Careers program class, and they are learning some of the soft skills that are going to make them successful for life. How to fill out a job application, how to write a resume, how to write a cover letter, um, how to go on a mock job interview. Are you artistic? I mean, I'm creative. <laughs> really? We just like them to make a goal, move towards something, and there's no lost experience. All the experience you pick up along the way, you will utilize in some way or another in any job that you have. Whether it be going to college, whether it be entering the workforce, or a military career, the student has that choice. We want to prepare them for whatever aspect of life they want to pursue. It's a different way of looking at education, which I think is now starting to shift in New Jersey, that people are looking at this more. And our kids have been amazing, and they go out and represent Gateway and themselves very well, um, and they help to grow the program as well. What it gives you is a list, then, of possible careers that might be matches for you. Resumes, handshakes, interviewing skills. These things really do make a difference, no matter the career. And when it comes to careers, be prepared to consider alternatives. Recently, I read that some experts predict the average person will change careers sometimes more than five times. Five. There's a lesson for you. And our next lesson, it's in medicine. I don't think he's breathing, Lucas. I'll check for a pulse. Can we get some help in here? Someone call a code. I got your bag. I'll do meds. I'll be recording. I've got crushes. One and two and three and four and five and six and seven and eight and nine and ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen. Press shock. Everybody's staying clear. We did the simulation of a calling code where like the patient stops breathing and you have to do chest compressions and shock and everything like that and that's just amazing we have that technology to be able to do that and simulate everything. We have a 1.3 million dollar learning lab that really mirrors what our rooms are like upstairs in the uh, in the other side of the hospital and this is a place where our clinicians can come and practice things that actually happen in real life to our patients. Now it's my chest and I can't breathe. He breathes, he talks, we can put the vital signs up on the monitor. We can attach it to our defibrillator and um, get the rhythm up there. We can actually shock um, that patient. So that experience is really real. Glad to Thank have you, you back, Chad. Good job, team. They had this idea of identifying high potential future virtual nurses and being a member of the Cherry Hill community and having children that have gone through West. That was a great idea to have some applied learning opportunities for students thinking about what their careers are gonna be in the future and also helping us to develop a workforce of the future. All right, so our goal today is to create the model of the human skeleton. This is just the beginning of your project. You know the internship really program we have with right? Virtua is pretty unique. We have seniors who have applied in the spring to be a part of the program and they take a half day session at Cherry Hill West they leave in the afternoon to go to Virtua. And when they go to Virtua, they get to shadow medical professionals and be a part of the medical profession, you know, as much as they can as a high school student. So it's a great program for them. They learn a lot. It gives them a taste of what the real working world is like. And 
nice, the Smith Peterson osteotome. So this uh, is, is cool because this goes right through the bone, so it's pretty much hit with the mallet, just like it looks like you're chiseling the, the statue of David, right? So we want it to be sharp. We want I wanted to be part of the internship program because I have this idea that I want to be a nurse, but the reality is I have no idea what nurses do day in and day out, and this program is really going to show me that. I think it's vital because we've seen it a million times, right? I mean, how many kids start off in one major and end up doing something completely different? And there's a lot of pressure on kids to know exactly what they're going to do when they go to college now. I don't feel like I had the same pressure at that age. So if you can have experiences out in the world of what you think you want to do that are real, then you can, it gives you an idea of whether that really is the right thing for you or not. So I was like, can I go here? Can I go there? And they were always like, yeah, of course. Like that everybody At first I thought I wanted to be a physical therapist. So I would have spent eight years getting my doctorate. But as soon as I got to shadow nurses, I was like, this is what I want to do with my life. So I would have like spent all this time in school and ended up going back for something else anyway. So it really definitely saved time and money. We still have no pulse. All right, compression. How many shocks? Only one. one. Five and six. And seven. Any epi? Nine and ten. Yeah. Eleven. We bring them into our learning center. We also put them then into these three-week rotations, two days a week. They can go to a variety of places within the hospital. Physical therapy, a med surge unit, the operating room, our joint replacement institute, infectious control. So there's a variety of places that they get exposed to. Most kids, they don't really know what it's all about, and when you get there, it's all there, it's real life. And I was put in really tough situations, like if a patient needed help or anything, I was there. I got to see two surgeries. I got to see a knee replacement, and then I got to see like an orthopedic hip replacement. So it's pretty, it's pretty cool. My first rotation, I went to Equipment Depot. So seeing the backstage, like making sure everything's sterilized and clean for the patients, because anything gone wrong with the equipment, that can damage and hurt the patient. So that's really cool to see. They go into everything with such a positive, open attitude, and I think that this gives them the opportunity to have so many different experiences that in the end they find that they're interested in something that they never thought that they would be interested in. I don't know of any program like this. There are some nurses camps where students can come in for an experience during the day or maybe a week long, um, but it's nothing like this where they come throughout the whole school year to have these applied learning experiences. And we found from last year's group that it actually really did influence what their college majors were. I saw such growth in them from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, and I knew that they were really ready for college. Because you worry about kids being ready for college and making the most of it, and I really felt like they were all prepared and that they had a real direction in their life at the end of the year. I think I want to work in medicine because I think I want to help people. I feel like that's so rewarding, and I can't imagine myself in a job where I wasn't giving back. Coming up, student beekeepers. We'll be right back. I never stopped trying to grow or change or learn. I'm still as shocked today as I was when I first found out that I was even my school's Teacher of the Year and then to be, you know, County Teacher of the Year, I, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. So I think what makes a great teacher is, is being reflective and always thinking how you could improve because, again, I, I can't even imagine I, I, I'm not the best. There's so much more I need to do. I, I Just last week I taught this thing and I didn't like it and I want to change it and I want to make it different and I want to make it better. So I think um, being reflective is, is what I think is most useful in teaching. This is called a hive, correct? Open up the top, pretend it's our new bees. Thousands and thousands of little worker bees in there. Pop them in there, pretend. We're popping them in. Pop them all in there. What are they making with the nectar? Honey. Honey, right, they're making honey. I teach experiential science program. I have a flower shop class, and I also teach what we consider to be a science two, which is biology. Today, our lesson was on beekeeping. Going over with the students a little review 
uh, first of what to look for in the hive. A hive inspection is what we call it. The honeybee is actually, if you didn't know this already, is New Jersey's insect. Now we have to place our little queen in here too. She's in here in this little box. The bees smell her in there. What do we have to do for now? We're gonna cover up the hive, correct? How long are we gonna wait, everybody, before we open it again to see if the queen's healthy and doing well? Two to three weeks. Good job, right. The population of bees is going down really fast because people don't understand how important they are. So like all the trees and flowers and all that wouldn't really be growing if the bees weren't here. Everybody needs to know about it because we wouldn't have fruits, vegetables without them and honey. Everybody likes, a lot of people like honey. They're all female bees. I've been a beekeeper for 10 plus years now. My whole point in bringing the program to the school was to make them environmental ambassadors and they've really grabbed a hold of it. And they're learning more and more, and they're learning how important it is to our environment. I've learned that over one-third of the crop's population is uh, pollinated by bees, which I found really a shocker, because I knew that bees pollinated crops and all that, but I didn't know they pollinated that much there. Topanga and I are gonna go out later, and we're gonna put another box on top, another super on top. What's that one gonna hold? The honey, right. The honey that we're going to leave for them for the winter, correct. After that little introduction, the kids go over how to remind how to put on their suits, and they practice putting on the suits and making sure that they're being proactive and covering up. So are we ready to go out to the hives now and do our inspections? We go into the hive, um, certain people have certain jobs. One person has a tool to open it up, one person uses the smoker to calm them down because of the aroma that they give off. Try not to be afraid of them. They're more afraid of you than you are them. This super that you're looking at is what we call the honey super. So there's the honey, huh? This is fall now, and there's a possibility that you might be seeing this in the winter time. I just want you to know that the hive never goes to sleep. It does not hibernate. Um, what happens inside the hive is that they will cluster together around their queen and they will travel around as a cluster to feed on the honey that's left behind. They will work very hard and use a lot of energy all winter long to keep that, by, by moving their wings, to keep that hive at about 90 degrees. If you are a good beekeeper, if you think naturally, you know you need to leave so much honey behind, 80 pounds or more, for that colony to survive over winter. How do they make the honey? They, it's kind of gross actually if you think about it. They grow up in the, each other's mouths. Okay. And then eventually they'll put it into one of these. Okay. The comb. So, and then they all flap their wings to get the moisture out. And then wow. there's honey. When they were finished with that, uh, they decided we were gonna come back into to the classroom with some frames that we needed to extract. We had a few extra frames that we wanted to um, extract to bottle up the honey. You would take a knife and you would go not too far in, but not too far out. You just get the wax off the honey cells, get all that off, and then put it to the extractor. Sierra's gonna do a little spin here to force the honey out of the cells. All the honey now is out of the frames. So we're gonna open up the honey gate. The only process that this is going through is that strainer that's collecting all the wax particles and any pollen that may have still been in those frames. This year, we probably took about 350 pounds off of our four hives. Now all the money that we make all goes back into the program. That's what keeps our program running. Most people think they don't really like bees just because they sting and hurts, but like it's, pretty awesome when you figure out more about bees. I care more about bees than what I used to. It's just great to learn. It's something new that you should try. There are small cues in your language that you can change to make us feel valid and heard. Wanting to hear our voice is such a rare experience. 
You can't not just feel empowered and excited and just heard for like the first time in like your uh, teenage years. Here at Roselle Park High School, students have the opportunity to engage in various STEM and STEAM-based curricula. But what you see these students working on is all taking place before homeroom. They call it zero period. It's definitely a challenge, just because we have to be here significantly earlier than everyone else is. But it's also fun because it's a commitment. A commitment that the 76 students who participate in Zero Period take pretty seriously. Zero Period is a wonderful opportunity for students that are intrinsically motivated. These areas are areas that excite them, that they want to pursue after high school. Currently, I synthesized aspirin, and I am testing the melting point against actual aspirin, acetosal. And I was comparing the melting points between the two, between the 100% purity and the one that I created to see if mine was pure enough. You could see the actual crystals, and once the crystals start to liquefy, that's the melting point of the aspirin, or that's the melting point of my compound. And we're trying What to really sparked my love for it was sophomore year in Mr. Bang's class. He had honors chemistry and I excelled in it. So what you see over Mr. Here, Bangs is a chemistry teacher and an instructor during zero period. You begin to see kind of a spark. What interests them? They may not be your best regular student in a class with the structure, and they blossom in these unstructured environments where they're able to explore concepts. This is like a UV sensor. It can detect wavelengths from 720 nanometers to around 1,000 nanometers, which is like red light. I had to make the chassis out of cardboard and a little electrical tape. To... I'm trying to push students into an area, open their minds of the futuristic goals, uh, growth experience for jobs and technology. The red player is being controlled completely by the computer, and the yellow character is being controlled by me, by a human. So I've been programming uh, a video game because you can visually see what, what you coded. Go for the throw. 30 seconds. During Mr. Chin's zero period, students can hone their robotic skills and explore other areas that interest them, like designing a shipping container for vaccine delivery to third world countries. So this layer would be filled with ice and ice bags because in order for a vaccine to be effective, they have to be in a certain temperature range. Which I find that our students are looking to break out of just the basic norm of education. And zero period really gives them that ability to branch out, to find out things that they wouldn't imagine doing in a school. For me, I learn more based on like, like hands-on projects. Zero period makes it able so that I can do my own work and I have the freedom and like availability to do my own work and do it my own way. Zero period also offers opportunities for students interested in the arts. In the beginning of the year, they all pick which projects they want to work on. So between Mr. Chin and my class, we divvy them out. So he takes the more engineering-focused projects, and I take more of the arts and design-focused projects. Fashion, photography, marketing, architectural design and interior design, and music production. And then teams are formed based off of who chose what. We're given a 40 by 8 shipping container, and we basically had to design a home inside of the container. That project is so thorough and so detailed, you have to learn almost everything you need to know about architecture to know it. So right here we have living space, the living area with the couch. Mm -hmm. and the they have to have a full set of working drawings, floor plans, elevations, section details of what's going on inside of the walls. And when you're thinking about a high school student, thinking about insulation in the walls, uh, I think we're at a different type of education at that point. We have to make a total of three garments that make a total of two outfits. And so we thought two things that go together are fashion and film. Part of one of our designs has the VHS tapes on it. 
So this is our mock-up VHS tape belt that we're going to be sewing on to the garment. You know, they don't have to come in and do this, but they're choosing in. They have that kind of passion inside of them to suck in everything that we're trying to teach them. And that's what makes the creative design environment thrive. In the back of the mind, some of these kids have projects. I would love to try this, but a curriculum does not allow me to explore that. And you pick up on that little bit of hidden talent, so we get supplies that they need, and give them that creative aspect at 7 o'clock in the morning. That's dedication, 7 o'clock in the morning. When one-sixth of your student population is involved in project-based learning, it makes them better learners overall because they're in charge, they're responsible, and they understand their responsibility to their own education. And when you walk into a classroom, you hear students speaking, and you don't hear this, the teacher speaking. That's my goal. I want student-directed learning at Roselle Park High School. There's going to be a, a bed on a platform, like a loft here. In fact, that student-directed learning may just inspire some of these kids to go into teaching. Another career I would highly recommend exploring. The more exposure young people have to potential careers, the more options will be open for them. Who knows how many future teachers, surgeons, nurses, and beekeepers we just met in the past half hour. So that's our show this week. If you missed any part of it, or you'd like to search our video library, please go to classroomcloseup.org. And join us next time to see more inspiring stories that happen every day in our great public schools. For Classroom Close Up New Jersey, I'm Sean Spiller. See you soon. Bye. <laughs>